state precisely what you're doing. But if you're introducing a new notion like the, on the topology problem with uh, the sequences, some people use the closure of a set, that's fine. But then you need to prove facts about it. Okay? So I just wanted to clarify that. And same thing for a test. You, you are allowed to use whatever we proved already. So let's, let's go over the, uh, this uh, week's homework. The first problem was about the sequence CN, where, uh, which is decreasing. So we have a sequence like that. And we are assuming that mu of E1 is finite. then the limit of mu of en is mu of the intersection over all the ens. Okay, that's what we'd like to prove. We did prove in class that if we have a sequence of increasing sequences, uh, if we have an increasing sequence, then uh, the limit existence is of mu of the union, and there we don't have this restriction here, which is a little annoying, unless you are a probabilist and you work with uh, mu equal 1 in any case, so that's uh, not a problem. Okay? But so, of many advantages of probability over analysis. So, We would like to prove that. Well, the first, the, the first remark, there are several ways to do this. One, one way is to define Fn as being uh, the E1 times complement of En. Well, times, uh, intersection, OK? One. So we have our two sets here. Why would we do that? Well. Uh, it turns out when, when, when you do this, Fn becomes increasing because if E2 is included in E1, then it's easy to see that the complement of E2, the complement of E1 is going to be included in the complement of E2. The complement operation is going to reverse your uh, inclusion. Okay? Um, so we, you know, it's uh, an elem elementary fact from measure, from set theory. Uh, and what we would do to show that would be that if, uh, so what do we have? If x does not belong to E1, then x cannot belong to E2. That's all we have to say. Okay, and this, this shows this inclusion. Because E1 is the bigger set. So if, if x does not belong to E1, then uh, since E2 is included in E1, then x does not belong to E2. And that's w so what we have just shown is that if x belongs to the complement of E1, then x belongs to the complement of E2. And therefore, what we are showing here is that the complement of E2 is included, uh, no, it's the other way, the complement of E1 is included in the complement of E2. Okay, so that's this. So our Fn is an increasing sequence, and we can say that the limit over n of mu of Fn exists. That's the fact we proved, and is equal to mu of union of Fn. Now, mu of Fn, let's look at this thing. Fn is 
mu of uh, E1 En complement. And where we can rewrite this as being mu E1 is mu E1 En plus mu E1 En complement. Okay, that's uh, something we we do quite often when we are dealing with uh, uh, problems of this stack, we decompose things. Now, E1 En is actually, uh, in this case, we are saying that we have a decreasing sequence. So En is included in, in E1. So this intersection is En. So we get mu of E1 equal to mu of En plus mu of E1 En complement. Now, uh, because we assumed that mu of E1 is finite, it means that all the, the ENs have finite measure, because E1 is the biggest one. And we know that uh, this is increasing. So we, we know that since EN is included in E1, uh, and then we, have, we know that mu of EN is less than or equal to mu of E1, which is finite. OK, so we know we're dealing with only finite uh, numbers here. And therefore, we can just express mu of e, uh, E1, En as mu of E1 minus mu of En. OK, so that's already uh, something. Now, on the other side, we let's try to compute this thing here. Union of Fn, what's that? That's the union of E1, En, complement which is E1 intersect union EN complement. Okay, we have a Boole algebra with intersection and union. We, can, we have distributivity. Uh, you're probably familiar with that, right? If I, I can just multiply across by E1 and I get what I had here. So this is E1 intersect, intersect of En complement. Okay, another fact from set theory, the, the complement of an intersection is the union of a complement. Okay. And now, uh, so that's the union of Fn. Okay, that's what we have on on our right hand side. And so we do we basically redo this manipulation here. Okay, that's that's all we need to do. And I should have written it in uh, in general. Let's see. Well, let's let's rewrite it. Um, so let's call this guy here, let's call this guy G. Okay, and uh, let's just uh, li look again at this thing. We are going to write that mu of E1 is mu of E1G plus mu of E1G complement. Okay, this is because this is a disjoint union, therefore the measures add up, that's all. 
And, but our G, what is our G? Our G, maybe you cannot see it. Our G is this guy. Okay, intersection over all the E's. And therefore, again, same thing as before, this is included in E1. And actually, we probably proved that already. But anyway, it's, uh, it's always, uh, it's probably better to redo the computation every time. And uh, so this is G. Therefore, we get that mu of G is mu of E1 minus mu of E1 G complement. Well, yeah, it doesn't. Well, the, the thing I really want actually is what I have there, which is, which is e one g. So what I really want, of course, it's the same thing. But what I really need is mu of e one g complement is mu of e one minus mu of g. So now uh, let's go back to our statement here. And let's write our statement with the new facts we know. So we are going to write that limit. Uh, instead of mu of fn, we are going to write down this that, uh, oh, here it is. Uh, this is mu of fn here, right? So mu of fn is mu of e1 minus mu of en. equal to uh, the other side, which is mu of the union, which uh, uh, we just uh, showed to be mu of E1 minus mu of G. OK, do I agree? I'm just replacing the two sides of my equality there. Uh, I computed them in function of the original E's. That's all I did. Now, of course, this is a constant, and it's a finite constant in this case. And so uh, the limit is going to be uh, the subtraction of the two. And the mu of E1's are going to cancel. And so we end up with limit of mu of En equal to mu of g, but mu of g, g by definition is the intersection of all the ends. Okay, in several places I have um, uh, changed sides with mu of e1. So several places it was crucial to know that mu of e1 was finite. Now, it may be that my proof is weak, and I need that hypothesis because I'm not able to produce a better proof. But that's not true in this particular case. There are counterexamples. If your mu of E1 is not finite, then it, your equality may very well be wrong. Okay? So counterexample. In the case mu of e1, so let's take a sequence e n to be uh, n n plus one over naturals bigger than n, and let's take for mu the counting measure. So I count the number of elements that I have in my set. So what is mu of en? It's infinity, right? I have infinitely many points every time. For every n, I know that mu of en is infinity. So I cannot apply the, the, the theorem that I just proved. Now, what is intersection of en? If I do my intersection over all ENs, what do I get? The 
So I need to be bigger than n for every n. Therefore, I get the empty set. There's nothing there. So you see that It is not true the limit of mu of en is not equal to mu of the intersection of the ens in this case, because this is 0 and this is infinity. Okay, They are really not equal. So that's why it's important when you are looking at decreasing sequences to make sure that you do have a finite measure for your larger set. Okay, otherwise you you get in trouble. You may get into trouble. Okay, so that was questions on this problem. Okay, it's a good problem because uh, you should, after we, we, I go over these problems, you should review them. In particular, a problem like that where you use several different uh, techniques that you need. Okay? It's, it's good to be able to redo this by yourself. Okay? So after you understand the proof, try to redo it by yourself. And if you get stuck somewhere, which you know, is quite, uh, it's not uh, insulting or anything, come to see me and we can uh, talk about it. Okay, uh, problem seven. So this was just uh, formal. So you are given a sequence of measures, well, a finite number of uh, measures, and some numbers, and positive numbers, and you want to show that uh, your linear combination is still a measure. You want to show that this thing is a measure. Well, first thing you need to check is that it's a positive function. So this, let's call it mu. Mu goes from your sigma algebra m into zero positive infinity. Right, because because your numbers are all positive here. Okay, so you are doing a linear combination of uh, positive numbers, possibly inf infinite ones. You are still getting an infinite, no uh, a positive number. Okay, so this is so because the AIs are positive or zero. That's why you cannot do a combination with negative A's. Then you don't know. It may get you to a negative value, and you don't want that. The second thing you want for a measure is measure of the empty set. Well, by definition, this is what mu of the empty set is. Each one of these guys is zero because it's a measure. they are measures. We know that, so we are doing a combination, a linear combination of zeros. We get a zero, and that's a true fact. And finally, if our so we take E n to be disjoint, and what uh, we have is. Well, we, we know that mu i of the union of E n is the sum over O n of mu i of E n. Okay. 
So I if we want to really be formal here, we can write this as being the limit as k goes to infinity of the sum from n equal 1 to k of mu i e n. Because well, this is what an infinite series is. It's a limit of a partial sum with a convention that if our partial sum goes to infinity, that's fine too. Okay, that's uh, our usual convention. OK, then what we do is, uh, uh, what can we do then? We, uh, we write down that. So how do I want to write this? Uh, <coughs> Oh, I have too many indices. Um, so what I want to do is to write mu. So OK, so let's use this remark here. Now let's do mu of um, In here? Here? Well, I, I, for the time being, I'm just looking at mu i, not at the linear combination. OK? But now I'm going to the linear combination. But yeah, it's probably not the more, most direct route. So mu of what, what are we trying to do now? We are doing mu of union of en. And that, by definition, is the sum of, so we say, uh, OK, so I shouldn't use, we should use, instead of n, let's use j here. And then this is from i equal 1 to n, a i mu i of the union over j of e j. Now, by because mu i is a measure, I know that this is the infinite sum uh, e j, mu of e j. I know this. And then I know that this is the limit over when k goes to infinity of a sum from j equal 1 to k of mu of e j. And now I claim that, so what, uh, and, and here I forgot my mu i. All these have mu i's. OK. So now what uh, do we have? So first thing, I'm going to say that this is the limit over all k of sum of i and a i sum of j equal 1 to k of mu i e j. So I claim that I can pull my limit outside. Can I always do that? Can I always say that the sum of the limits is the limit of a sum? Well, not always, but if the sum is finite, yes. Here I have a finite sum. You see, I have only n of these guys. So that's why it's legal to do it. But that's precisely why we are doing this course, is to find conditions where we can do that for infinite sums. OK? So you, we need to be careful here. So the thing is, n is fixed, OK? n is 10. I'm adding 10 measures. And then the limit of uh, the sum of 10 is the same of, uh, as uh, the, the, limit, the sum of the limits of uh, these 10 things. So that's fine. Now, 
This thing here can be uh, exchanged. That's just uh, now. I, once I'm, I get rid of my limit, I can do addition uh, distributivity, and uh, uh, this is the same as limit k from j equal one. So is that what I want? I guess so. J equal one to k of sum from i equal one to n of a i mu i of e j. Now I'm just doing some algebra. I have a finite sum up to k, a finite sum up to n. I can add in whichever order I want. Okay? I'm not doing anything special now because I got my limit out. This is now mu. By definition, this is mu of e j. And now this is the limit as k goes to infinity of uh, this sum. And that, by definition, is uh, the infinite series mu of e j. So to do it properly, you do need to work a little bit. Okay, because you have an infinite sum running around with a finite sum, and, and then exchange your two sums, and, and then you get what you want. So the three properties are proved, and we get that um, this, is, uh, this is a measure okay, when we do that. Now, is there another question about uh, when is it finite? I forgot my book and my notes, which is not recommended. Yeah. Thank you. Now, OK. So that's all we need to do. So now we're going to do 8. Okay, so we want to prove things about lim inf and lim subs. Is it okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Questions? Let's start with proving that mu of lim inf of my e end is less than the lim inf of the mu, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. Now, th this is a very convenient notation, but remember that lim inf of a set is a set. Lim inf of numbers is a number, possibly infinity. Okay? They don't reuse the same, no, the same notation, but they don't represent the same thing. Okay? And, but, I mean, usually there is no confusion because you know what you're doing. You know that these are sets, so you get a set. This is, these are numbers, so you get a number. Okay? It's very convenient because it's nice to write it like this. If we use another notation, it wouldn't be as satisfying aesthetically. Okay, so that's, that's why it's good to use it, but it's also good to remember what they mean. So our definition of lim inf of a set En, of a sequence uh, uh, of sets En, is this. Okay, remember, you, you end with an inf, so that's why I know I have an intersection. And because I have an intersection here, I need a new unit here. That's how I remember how to write it. 
So, okay, we have this thing, and now uh, let's call this guy Fn. So it's a union of Fn, but Fn is Fn. I'm taking I'm taking an intersection, and I'm taking less and less sets in my intersection, which means that my Fn is an increasing sequence. Right? You put less and less sets in your intersection, you get something which is bigger and bigger. Okay, all, all I'm saying is that uh, A intersect B uh, is in A. That's, that's all we're doing here. Or A intersect B intersect C is in A intersect B. Okay, that's that's simple fact that we are using. Okay, so the FN are increasing, we like that, because we know that the limit of mu of FN exists and is mu of the union of the FN. And at this point, I'm jumping with joy because the union of Fn is precisely my limit. Okay, so I have at least one sign, which is what I want. Okay, so this is limit of En by definition. Now, what can we do about this guy here? That's not so nice, but. But what I can say is that uh, certainly Fn is included in En for every n. Why? Well, remember that my Fn, by definition, is En intersect En plus 1, En plus 2, and so on. So Fn is in each one of these guys. In particular, it's in En. That's why I can say that. Now I say that mu of Fn is less than mu of En. And now I'd like to pass to the limit, which is fine, because on this side I have a limit. But on this side, I don't. I don't know. Yen may be very wild, and maybe this thing doesn't converge at all. So that's where lim inf is so important. I write that the lim inf of mu of Fn is less than lim inf of mu of En. But if my sequence converge, what can I say about the lim inf of a sequence? It's the limit, right? If, if it converges, then the lim inf, lim sub, they are all the same. So I know that this is the limit. And the limit I have computed already is mu. So this is the limit, and it's mu of union of Fn. Less than lim inf of mu of en. But as observed before, this is precisely mu of lim inf of en. Therefore, I have my inequality. Now, uh, questions about this? Now, why did I pick lim inf? I could have picked lim sub. Right? 
Well, Li Minfi is better. You see, because I'm telling you that lim inf, which is the smallest uh, limit of my sequence, is bigger than something. That's a better result than telling you that the biggest limit is bigger than something. That's why we use lim inf and not lim sub. But the, the, the lim sub would be perfectly fine, and we know that now, because this is less than the lim sub in any case. So it's true with the lim sub. But the reason why you use Liminf is because you are proving uh, an inequality on this side. If you were showing something on the other side, you would use Lim sub because it would give you a better limit. Do you see it? OK, so now let's do Lim sub. But with lim sub, there is a small, uh, yeah, you need something more, and you are going to see why. You need to know that, so now assume that mu of the union is finite. Then mu of lim sub of en is going to be bigger than, or is it? Uh, uh, no. Mu of lim sub is going to be bigger than the lim sub. So as you're going to see, it's going to be very similar. We're going to do the same thing with the difference that we'll be having a decreasing sequence this time, and therefore we'll get an intersection. And that's why we have this condition here, because of the first homework problem. So um, what we write down, what our lim sub is. So, so you know it's union, ek, and now it's intersection over all. Okay. So this time, my Fn is union or k larger than n of ek. So I'm taking less and less in my union. So that gives me something decreasing this time. Okay, Because, of course, a union b is more than a. That's all. So Fn is decreasing, and F1 is union from k larger than 1 of ek. And we know that mu of F1 is finite. That's precisely what we were told. Therefore, I can apply my limit and say that the limit of mu of Fn is mu of intersection of Fn. But when you do your intersection of Fn, you get precisely lim sub. OK, so we have one side. And now we have to, to do something similar to what we just did for the other side. So what is Fn? Fn is En union En plus 1, union En plus 2, and so on. So we have that En is included in Fn, which tells me that mu of En is less than mu of Fn. So this time, 
um, I have an, equ an inequality on this side, I'm going to use lim subs because it gives me something more than lim inf. So I'm going to say that lim sub of mu of en is less than lim sub of mu of fn. But again, this converges. So the lim sub is the same as the limit. And that turns out to be mu of union of fn. So we end up with lim sub of mu of en less than mu of lim sub of en. Because this is precisely lim sub of en. Okay, nine. Okay. So uh, we can write that E union F is E. Uh, E F complement union F can we do that? So let's we have E, we have F. So what I'm saying is that the union is this guy, which is E F complement together with this guy. Okay, and they are disjoint. That's that's why I'm writing it like this. So, mu of E union F is mu of E F complement plus mu of F. Then we do the usual uh, trick. We write that E now is E F union E F complement which tells me then that mu E is mu E F plus mu E F complement. OK, so that's mu E. So, so now, um, yeah, there. OK. So now well, there are two cases. First one, mu of e f is infinity. That's a possibility. But if mu of e f is infinity, then it means that mu of e is infinity, mu of f is infinity, and mu of e union f is also infinity. And so your identity is obviously true. You have infinite everywhere. OK, you can write that mu of E union F plus mu E intersect F is mu of E plus mu of F. This is a true statement because you have infinity equal to infinity. Now, uh, the other case is mu E F finite. If it's finite, then I can write that mu E F complement is mu of E minus mu E F. OK? 
okay, I'm going back to my identity here. Okay? And then uh, what do I have? Mu, then I go back to there, which is mu of E union F equal to this guy, mu E minus mu E F plus mu of F. So we get mu of E union F plus mu E F equal to mu E plus mu F. So again, I'm, I'm changing sides for this guy, but I know it's finite, so that's, that's OK. I can do that. Okay. Did you need to distinguish the two cases too, or you don't remember? Oh, you didn't. Okay, but but did you need to to do to change sides for one of the terms? Maybe not. Maybe there is a, a more direct way to do things. And finally, 10 didn't look so long when I signed it. Uh, we have a trace measure. So <coughs> we define mu e as being mu a e oh well, mu e of a as being mu e of a intersect e. So we're giving a measure mu, and we define a new measure mu e like this. Okay, so, you, so you just need to check the three properties. Uh, first thing, obviously, mu, mu e is uh, a positive function. Okay, that's because it's a mu of something, so it needs to be positive. Mu of the empty set, mu e of the empty set, is mu of empty set times e, which is empty. So we get 0. And if we take a sequence an of these joint sets, We need to look at the mu of the union, mu e of the union, which is mu of the union intersect e, which is mu of union a and e. And the a and e are also disjoint. Right, if you if you have nothing in between uh, at the intersection of uh, A I and A J, by restricting your A's to E's, you're not going to have more. You're going to have less in your intersections. So clearly, they are also going to be disjoint. And because they are disjoint, and because mu is a measure, this is just a sum of mu A and E. Is that all? Okay, so 
that's the homework. Yeah, so let me assign homework for next week. So that's the 20th. Oh, by the way, uh, 19th. Uh, I had planned on the test for September 26, I think. That's too early. Okay. So let's push this back two weeks to October, October 10, which hopefully is a Wednesday. Does this work? Do you have already four tests for that day? So let's, yeah, let's plan this. Uh, I, I want you to get a little more familiar with uh, the new material before we go into a test. So anyway, so for September 19, uh, I'd like you, well, first thing, I should define these things. So we, ask, we haven't talked about functions yet, and this is about integration, so we need functions at some point. So, uh, of course, you know what a function is. And uh, uh, th there is a special notation, which you may or may not have seen, which is the following. Uh, if I have, so for a function f, f of a is the set f of x where x belongs to a. OK, so it's just the range of your function starting at a. You also can define f minus 1 of b. And here you need to be careful. It's again a notation which is used in two different uh, ways. f minus 1 is the inverse function. But f minus 1 of b is not the inverse function, okay? because this is a set. And uh, your f may very well not be invertible, so no inverse function. So f minus 1 of b is all the axes such that f of x belongs to b. Okay, you look at all the possible axes that will give you an image in b. Okay? So we need that quite a bit. Well, we need to be familiar with this notation. Uh, so uh, take f from r to r and x to x square and find uh, f of r and f minus 1 of 0, 1, for instance. And of course, this function is not 1 to 1 from r to r, as you know. So, but this is still well defined just to give you a feeling of what this thing does. And f of minus 1, 1. Okay. And then I also would like you to find a relation between f of a. So this is in general. Okay, so f of a union f of b, I'd like you to compare this to f of a union b. 
So some of these things will be equal, some will not be equal. If they are not equal, find a counterexample. Okay, show that you know they can be strictly included one in the other. And then f of a intersect b compared to f of a intersect f of b. And same thing for the f minus 1. f minus 1a union f minus 1b compared to f minus 1 of a union b. And f minus 1 of a intersect b compared to f minus 1 of a intersect f minus 1 of b. Yeah, then uh, homework three. If the series mu of EN is finite, show that mu of lim sub of EN is zero. This will depend on so let's take a ten minutes break and then we'll